Hello, I'm Jochen Koch, Professor of Management, Organization and Entrepreneurship at the European University Viadrina. This video builds on my first video on leadership in times of crisis. And I would like to highlight here another important facet of leadership in the context of crisis situations. If we compare the situation of the war in Ukraine with the pandemic and the so-called COVID crisis, a key difference becomes apparent in terms of the constitution of the two crises. A pandemic confronts the affected societies with a challenge in the sense of it or us. It is, we are, at least initially, fighting together against something, it, that has interrupted our normal life and prevents normal continuing. War as a crisis, on the other hand, involves a different constellation of crisis that is relevant for leadership and the sense-making process of the crisis. A war always involves at least two parties who are in confrontation with each other. In this sense, it is a matter of them or us for both parties. This schematic juxtaposition does not, of course, exclude intermediate stages. Thus, even during the pandemic, we have seen how certain social forces have repeatedly attempted to turn the it or us challenge of the COVID crisis into an adversarial them or us challenge and thus construct a particular enemy. War as a crisis, on the other hand, is always already constituted in such an opposition and in the structure position of friend versus foe, of good versus evil, of righteousness versus criminality, and so on. Thereby, the perspective is automatically doubled, because the Samoras constellation is constituted on both sides of the confrontation, only with inverted signs. In this sense, we are dealing with two mutual interrelated systems in which both leadership functions as the central mode of crisis leadership, or should we not better say, war leadership. Against this background, a second equally central aspect becomes obvious. Even so, wars often emerge from very complex political, economic and or geostrategic antecedents that make it difficult to assign simple culpability, these crises always manifest themselves as a blaming game as well. Wars manifest as a confrontation between an aggressor and a party that must defend itself as a result of an attack. However, who takes which role or to whom which role is attributed is itself the subject of the confrontation. Every country has a right to defend itself, whereas no country has the right to invade another. In this respect, it is probably part of the fundamental rhetoric of every war, even when the first stone has been thrown, to make it appear as the second stone. In this respect, this role assignment and the claim to stand there as the attacked and not as the aggressor is a very central element in the sense-making process of a crisis constituted by war. This is of essential importance for the respective leadership systems that confront each other in such a conflict. Unlike crisis situations, which are constituted by an it or us, war crises are not only about creating a sense of urgency and adequate action, but primarily a sense of enmity from which the sense of urgency and action is then derived. In doing so, action is basically tried to be framed as reaction. Since both sides claim for themselves the role of self-defense and not the role of the aggressor, in a military confrontation one has to deal with at least two contrary, usually diametrically, opposed constructions of reality for which each leadership system tries to mobilize followers. A crisis constituted by a war therefore also changes the parameters for leadership in at least three respects. 
First, it is important to assume not only one, but at least two leadership systems that position themselves in an antagonistic relationship to each other. Second, the sense of urgency and adequate action is derived from this antagonistic relationship in which both leadership systems position themselves. And thirdly, this logically leads to a doubling of reality constructions. Since each leadership system tries to produce its own reality construction and this in an antagonistic way to the opposing side. So let us first call the two leadership systems 1 and 2 for further distinction. This extension or doubling makes clear that the mutual reference to the adversary is a constitutive element for the respective leader-follow relationship in the internal relationship of the both leadership systems. It is this sense of opposition or enmity, the reciprocal assignment of the other side as aggressor and oneself as attacked, that strongly shapes the sense-making process and at the same time is accompanied by a great reduction in complexity. Both leadership systems can make use of this reduction in complexity in their respective internal relationships. The more they succeed in presenting and legitimizing their own role and their own actions as a necessary, indeed inevitable reaction in defense against the other side. Consequently, we are dealing here not only with two competing sense-making systems, but with two systems that are practically inverse to each other in their respective construction of reality. To put it more pointly, if R is constructed on the one side, not R is constructed on the other side. Now, however, both leadership systems refer to one and the same reality of war and struggle to use the evidence of facts for their own purposes and at the same time to produce evidence performatively that corresponds to their own respective objectives. Here we see what is practically a truism about every war, namely that one of the first causalities of war is always the truce. But what can now be said about the two antagonistic leadership systems with regard to the effectiveness and viability of their respective constructions of reality? So far we have presented the two leadership systems 1 and 2 as practically symmetrical. But at the same time we have already indicated that the distribution of roles, who is the aggressor and who is the aggressed, is itself the subject of contestation. If both leadership systems now assert antagonistic, mutually exclusive reality constructions, then the success of the respective reality construction depends on the extent to which the respective leadership systems succeed in generating followership for their reality claims. A war as a physical action, an exercise of force, aims in the case of defense to repel the opponent, in the case of the aggressor, however, to subdue the opponent, even often to destroy him partially or even completely. In the sense of a physical confrontation, a war provides the possibility of simply physically enforcing one's own reality construction. At the same time, however, a war as long as it is not physically decided, it is always also a struggle for the interpretive dominance of information and thus constructions of reality, and is thus fought not only physically, but also communicatively. This means that both antagonistic leadership systems also fight communicatively for the prevailing reality construction both in their respective internal relations and in their external relations with the other leadership system, as well as before the world community. With regard to this communicative struggle, two basic types of leadership systems can be distinguished, an open and a closed leadership system. Even though there are, of course, always intermediate forms between complete openness and complete closure, 
and both extreme positions hardly ever occur in reality. This ideotypical comparison is useful for illustrating the mode of operation of both systems. So let us assume that leadership system 1 is a completely open leadership system, while leadership system 2 is a completely closed one. First of all, it should be noted, even if we assume in the sense of constructivism that realities are communicatively co-constructed, these constructions are by no means arbitrary, nor can they be completely manipulated and instrumentalized. This means that we have to assume structural limitations to the distortion of reality constructions and these lie in the communicative properties of the respective leadership systems. In a democratically constituted, communicatively open leadership system, in which the right to freedom of expression exists in principle, leadership is based on the voluntarily constituted convictions of the followers. This conviction can be rational and or more emotionally based. It has more knowledge based and or more faith and trust based. Central, however, is that followers always have an actual choice and are not cursed into following. The absence of coercion and the conviction in the rightness and legitimacy of leadership gained on the basis of individual freedom are constitutive of followership in open leadership systems. Leadership in this sense is a matter of majoritarianism. It has the fundamental heterogeneity of followership can only be homogenized in a majority on the basis of voluntarily one conviction and leadership in such systems must regularly legitimize itself through actually competitive elections. This anchoring in a fundamentally pluralistic system of opinion imposes clear limitations on forms of reality construction. These limits of reality construction and sense-making are systematically undermined in closed communicative leadership systems. Dictatorships are prime examples of such closed leadership systems. The issue of gaining followers is not exclusively done by generating voluntarily consent, but on the basis of indoctrination and, most centrally, through the physical suppression of dissenting voices. In dictatorships, the fundamental heterogeneity of potential followers is thus homogenized by propaganda on the one hand and by violence-based exclusion mechanisms on the other. To this end, dictatorships reproduce their image of the enemy in internal relations. Anyone who is not for us is against us and therefore no longer has a right to exist. Such leadership systems are totalitarian and they are tyrannies because, in the final consequence, they can only physically suppress dissenting voices. Consequently, in closed leadership systems, information becomes propaganda and argumentative persuasion becomes physical violence. In this way, however, possible constructions of reality in dictatorships lose all traction and the two closure mechanisms of propaganda and physical force lead to an increasingly distorted construction of reality in the case of continuing closure. Dictatorships, in a certain sense, are self-reinforcing because the more propaganda and physical violence have to be used to maintain followership, the further the reality construction moves away from a reality that is accessible to outside observers, and the more this is the case, the more propaganda and physical violence are needed to make these deviations invisible in internal relationships so that the followership can be maintained. If we now contrast an open and a closed leadership system in a war conflict and ask ourselves which of the associated reality constructions is the superior one, it becomes clear that the closed leadership system will ultimately only be able to enforce its reality construction exclusively by physical force. 
Once the exclusion mechanisms are set in motion, such a system will sooner or later inevitably steer toward a form of tyranny that can only hold on to power through further violence. In contrast, the open leadership system will be able to rely on generating or maintaining followers through information and argumentative persuasion. In this sense, it must succeed in exposing the opponent's propaganda as such and refuting it through open and transparent communication. The closed, dictatorial leadership system will itself try to expose these approaches to open communication as propaganda for its own purposes and at the same time try to undermine the opponent's followership through its own propaganda. It will therefore try to present its own leadership system as strong and superior and declare the vulnerability of the open leadership system as fundamental weakness and inferiority. Unfortunately, it is sometimes this ostentatious demonstration of strengths that also catches on in open leadership systems and finds followership. However, the strength of the open leadership system lies precisely in its supposed weakness, namely the open possibilities of exerting influence based on argumentative conviction and truthful communication. Thus, leadership in open systems always remains tied back and cannot, as in closed systems, drift into an arbitrary construction of reality. It is therefore probably one of the categorical errors of closed dictatorial leadership systems that sooner or later they always fall for their own propaganda. The loss of reality, which increases over time, is systematically inscribed in such systems, and sooner or later this always leads to their downfall. In the foregoing, I have very deliberately refrained from giving a concrete example of my considerations on the basis of the current war in Ukraine, and have also kept the comparison of the two leadership systems ideal typical in order to illustrate the core of such a conflict from a leadership perspective in a prototypical way. These considerations should not obscure the fact that every war is first and foremost a physical conflict. At the same time, however, every war always means a dispute over the interpretive sovereignty of the facts, which is constitutive for the respective leadership systems involved and their possibilities and limits for generating followership. In this sense, the loss of reality, which is inscribed in every dictatorial leadership system, is at the same time its central breaking point, so to say, where the lever has to be applied. For what is true for leadership in general is true for dictatorial leadership systems in particular. Every dictator has followers who make this dictator such in the first place. The longer such a tyranny exists and the more victims it claims, the more guilt all those who support such a system as followers will burden themselves with. Moreover, dictatorial leadership systems should also not underestimate the defensibility of democratic open leadership systems in such war crisis situations. Because the antagonistic confrontation with a dictatorial leadership system aiming at destruction also enables a strong mobilization of followers in open leadership systems. Not out of coercion, of course, but precisely out of the awareness and conviction of being on the side of justice and doing the right thing. Followers of an aggressive dictatorship may also believe this about themselves, but history shows that sooner or later there will be always a terrible awakening for them. May all these people awaken as soon as possible and put an end to this and any other war.